All right, time for our panel now. We're joined by Nick Cater from the Menzies Research Centre as well as Simon Breeny from the Institute of Public Affairs. Gentlemen, thanks for your company. Good, Good afternoon, Peter. Is same-sex marriage going to blow up in the Liberal Party room next week? Yes or no, Nick Cater? <laughs> Am I a soothsayer, Peter? Look, I mean, it, it's obviously going to be a, an issue which has to be resolved and... Uh, you know, well, I mean, you, you know, it, it ha there are strong opinions on both sides, but I, I think that possibly this plebiscite idea, a postal plebiscite, uh, may be the way through. I mean, fundamentally, I think the party has to stick to its policy that it went to the last election with, which is a plebiscite, and not only because it's an election promise, but because um, the broader public actually having been told they were going to get a say uh, won't be happy to so, be told so, they won't so get a say. So I think the postal plebiscite is probably the way to go. Simon Brini, do you agree with that? I mean, it looks like the parliament will block them on the plebiscite if it doesn't become a postal one, which obviously doesn't require the parliament to approve it. Uh, some Liberals, a small number, it has to be said, seem to be saying, well, we tried, we've honoured our election commitment because we tried, maybe try again, we've tried twice, but then we move on to a free vote. Others, the majority, I suspect, will land in the party room, I agree with Nick Cater on this, on the idea of a postal plebiscite because it's still on as the commitment and it bypasses parliament, so, you know, off they go. Yep, I think that's about right. I think even though it's terrible policy, I think the plebiscite's a bad idea. I think that the fact that it's non-binding, it still leads only to a free vote in the parliament. Um, I think it's a, an absolute nonsense of a policy. Why bother if it's not going to be binding on, at the very least, coalition MPs who have taken this now to the last election? But uh, I think they've got to stick with it. I think Nick's absolutely right. I think that given that that was the commitment that was made by the coalition in the lead-up to the last election, this is the way that the Australian people were told this issue would be dealt with. I think they have to stick with it. Um, but is this going to blow up as an issue next week in the party room? Yes, I think, uh, I think it will. And when it does, the, the question then becomes what's at play here. I mean, Nick Cater, uh, you know, you're a former editor of the Weekend Australian newspaper where I continue to have a column and did have under your tutelage. I'm, uh, I'm of the view, uh, and I might write about this for this weekend, I'm of the view that, quite frankly, uh, I think that the goings on at the moment amongst the half a dozen or so uh, members of the Ginger Group who are advocating for this idea of a, a, a same-sex marriage free vote or their willingness to cross the floor, if you like, I'm of the view uh, that they're perhaps in on it uh, and that this is a way of putting pressure on some Conservatives that don't want anything but a parliamentary full plebiscite and they see that even as a wedge of getting them to the next election, sticking to that without any action on same-sex marriage and perhaps even forcing the party to then take that same policy to the next election. What do you think? Well, that's an interesting theory. You may be right. I mean, I think I'm inclined to take people at their word. People say they, they believe in this issue because it's an important issue for them and their friends and the people that they represent. And, and let, let, let's, let's assume that's the case. But I think what I'm, what I'm uh, surprised about is really that we're allowing the debate to get sidetracked on an issue which is, uh, you know, with great respect, not the main game. Well, the main that, game is, is the economic prosperity and oh, future of this country. And, 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 and yeah. I couldn't agree more, Nick Hayden. We're going to get to some of that because there's that interesting report out of Melbourne University mm. and we'll get to all of that. But, but on this, they've got no one to blame but themselves, do they? I mean, I know Malcolm Turnbull was getting frustrated about the questions he was getting in his interview. What does he expect? You know, it's his own colleagues that keep bobbing their heads up and offering opinions on this and then the media understandably report on it and ask questions about it. Look, I'm not criticising the media. You're right. The media, the media, the media goes on on what's what's there. Sure. You know what people are saying and talking about. What I'm talking about is, I guess, internal party discipline. And I'm saying this as an observer from outside, not as somebody who's involved in party room decisions. But I, I would have thought that, given uh, our position or the, the Liberals' position in the polls, uh, given the 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 what the genuine. Uh, alternative now that there is with a shortened government which you know many of us would would uh, would think was uh, 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 not a great way to go I would have thought that has got to be the main game which is winning the next election on sound economic policy and keeping out you know the rather sort of strange weird ideas that shortened and labor are presenting to the electorate that's got to be the main game and so I, it is frustrating for me at least as a policy person that we're getting sidetracked into an issue like this and just finally on this issue before we move on, Simon Brini, how damaging would it be 
to Malcolm Turnbull's leadership. If same-sex marriage gets legislated on his watch against his wishes with a breaking of ranks from Liberal MPs that decide to cross the floor? Oh, look, there's no doubt that, uh, that that wouldn't be a positive thing for Malcolm Turnbull's leadership. But, um, you know, whether there's enough support within the party room for a change of leadership, I, I don't know. Um, I, my suspicion is probably not. And frankly, I would hope that there isn't. The idea of the Liberal Party changing leaders off the back of an issue like same-sex marriage, I think, um, would say a lot about the depressing place that centre-right politics is in in Australia at the moment, and in particular where the Liberal Party is. The sort of language that we're hearing, the sort of rhetoric that's being used, the tactics that are being used around this issue on both sides of the debate um, are, are pretty serious. And, you know, for people to be suggesting that they might cross the floor, for there to be a spill motion when it comes to the leadership on this issue, um, you know, my hope is that people are as passionate about same-sex marriage as they are about a whole range of other mm. issues. I really want for federal coalition MPs to come to the barricades on freedom of speech, on high taxes, on you know this crazy idea that we, we start um, taxing uh, trusts more highly that the Labor Party is putting forward. You know those are the issues that I hope that a lot of these people come to the barricades over, um, even after this issue of same-sex marriage is is uh, is resolved one way or another by the party room. Well, we'll find out. Stay with us, gentlemen. We're going to take a quick break. Let's get back to the panel, Simon Brini, as well as. Nick Cater, Simon, I might start with you. I want to move on now to some of these weighty issues. Inequality, Bill Shorten seems to be talking about it. Does he get some support on the idea of there being growing inequality in this country with some of the findings of that 17,000 strong survey being conducted by Melbourne University? Yeah, look, uh, of course, uh, I think Bill Shorten is looking for this issue to be a very significant issue in the lead-up to the next federal election. I think that this is uh, a smart political move, frankly, on the part of Bill Shorten, and I think it's going to be a really interesting one for the coalition to try and tackle. I think the way that they've got to do this, the way that they've got to inoculate themselves against this idea that inequality is the most important uh, value at the centre of policy making is to say that opportunity, in fact, is much more important. And the reason that opportunity is important is not only because it gives freedom people the freedom to live their own lives as they see fit, but also because it's the best way of tackling the problem of inequality. The sort of answers that Bill Shorten is going to put, put forward over the next few months, and we're starting to see that already in the last couple of weeks, um, is going to be to try and make the richer poorer. So um, that's his way of tackling inequality. The Coalition has got to say, no, 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 we don't care how rich the rich are. What we care about is lifting people who are not doing so well out of those circumstances and push them up the income ladder. So I think that's the way that they've got to deal with this problem. Nick Cater, are these separate debates, this idea of you need to do something about inequality, i.e. to reduce the gap between, if you like, haves and have-nots? Or can you have a separate debate and never sort of, if you like, consider that and say, look, we just need to make sure that everyone is getting wealthier, even if there happens to be a growing gap between some groups, I, I, as long as we're all better off? I, I, I think it's exactly the same debate, because I think what Labor has done, I think, very very well, very cleverly, is that they've, they've listened to people, they've listened to the electorate, they've clearly been conducting focus groups to feel, see what people feel, and people feel that you know they're working harder than ever. They're, they're they're working two jobs in a family, you know, and yet they're struggling to to stay ahead. They're struggling to pay off the mortgage. They're struggling even at low interest rates. They're struggling with power bills. They're struggling with childcare, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And of course, wages, apart from in the public sector, wages are pretty static. So there is this widespread feeling that people feel that somebody's getting ahead and it's not them. So Labor's tacked into that with with I think. I think it's quite a, a, a cheap and, and very, very unhelpful narrative, uh, and it plays into all this, you know, hurt the rich and, 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 and class warfare, which Australians really don't like, they don't buy. But I think the way we have to respond to this uh, from a more sensible policy perspective is, as Simon said, it, it, it's about opportunity. We have to show people that we will present policies and answers which will allow them to get ahead, which will allow everybody to have equal opportunity. Uh, rather than equal outcomes and, and, and that there will be, you know, if you work hard, you can, uh, you can look forward to a better future and your, your children can have a better future. We have to restore that vim, 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 vision and that's, I think, because we failed to do that, I think that's what Labor is able to play upon. How do we do that, in your opinion, Simon Brini? And I'll get Nick Cater's how-to in a moment. I mean, at the end of the day, wages are so stagnant. You know, one of the problems is growth is not good enough. 
Yep, that's exactly right. And and the, the key myth right at the heart of what the Labor Party's solutions are is that the economy is a zero-sum game. That is the idea that the Coalition have got to tackle. They've got to fight that idea every single day. And they've got to say that just because other people are getting ahead doesn't mean that you can't too. Um, there's not the same pool of money out there and we're all going after the same dollars. That's not the way that a growing economy works. Um, it can certainly work in the opposite direction. Um, we can have less money to go around, but what the Coalition has got to make sure that they're doing what is growing changes? the economy. So what, how? Well, well, look, frankly, I think they've been advocating on, uh, on some measures. I think they've been talking about the right thing. I think that when it comes to company tax, for instance, the idea that company taxes should be cut is a very good policy. The problem, of course, is the idea that we've now got, which is a, a tiered company tax system where you start cutting taxes for small businesses. Um, we might end up in, in years to come with a progressive rate of tax, which I think it would be, a, would be a disaster because of the incentives that it puts in place for breaking up businesses and, and creating sort of fictitious legal structures that, and that sort of Nick thing. Cater, but I think that's a, so, that's a good idea. OK, let me just jump in. Let's go back and forth on that issue first. Nick Cater, do you agree that that's a, a worry, this idea of an ever-increasingly progressive tax system for business, not just for individuals? Of course it is. We've got one of the most progressive tax systems in the world and we keep label it, lay, layering on all sorts of things that make it even worse. And, and look, this is a real problem. I mean, it's going to be a problem if Labor gets, gets its policy of putting 2% on everybody, all wage owners above 87%. They can call it a deficit levy or whatever. But what that does is then create this huge, you know, effective marginal tax rate jump. It, it means that people will have less motivation for working harder and earning more. You know, we need to have a system which says, if you work, you will be better off. You know, that we won't have taxes or, and other uh, and benefits that off offset that. We need to have a straight, ordinary, uh, uh, progressive tax system with sensible transition points so no matter where you're at, you know that if you go and work an extra day or you work a bit harder, you will earn more money. Now, at the moment, we don't have that. We have to reintroduce that incentive. But I also think we have to do something else, and that is tackle this business of entitlement because the other thing I think that's really annoying people is the sense that some people j just aren't putting in and yet they're getting rewarded through welfare or handouts or whatever. And, and I think we have to show that the welfare system is effective and fair as well and that that's not being rorted. I actually want to shift to another issue now with the time that we've got remaining. I, I noticed the Australian are reporting this on their website, but it's an issue that I've certainly had a long-term interest in, the, the break-up of the GST from state to state. The WA, the new WA Labor Premier there, Mark McGowan, is basically saying to Malcolm Turnbull, you're the Prime Minister, you know, get your act together. Don't try and blame the rest of us. It's not up to me to convince Bill Shorten of X, Y or Z. He's the opposition leader. Do it you're in power. It's not an unfair point, is it? Oh, look, I think uh, it's a bit cheap. Um, you know, Mark McGowan wants to have his cake and eat it too here. He wants to make sure that the GST share, the, the slice that Western Australia receives, um, is fairer. I think that's a, that's a good goal. And he's, he's out public in... on it. So, you know, yeah, he, yeah. What, what, he talks yeah. to the incumbent. What, you know, what can Bill Shorten do? Uh, well, Bill Shorten can support it in the Senate. I mean, um, I think he, he could go a long way, actually, to making sure that this actually happens if, behind closed doors, he does have those conversations with Bill Shorten to say, look, you know, it's deeply unfair that Western Australia um, is basically subsidising uh, Tasmania. Um, and, you know, can we, can we fix this problem? Can you, can you make sure that, in a bipartisan way, this gets fixed? Now, um, I'm not one for, uh, for arguing for bipartisanship on too many issues, but uh, on, on this one I think it's a pretty sensible idea. Otherwise we're going to see the sort of things that we've seen already in, in South Australia. Um, we may see that uh, across other parts of the economy where they start saying, well, this consensus of getting rid of inefficient taxes at the state level is something that's just not valuable to us anymore. We want to make sure that we're getting our own streams of revenue. We're going to do that by putting in place um, dangerous taxes like the South Australian bank tax. Yeah, but what do they expect, Nick Hader? I mean, South Australia looks to have a bank tax because the federal government imposes a bank tax. Guess what? That's what happens when a Liberal government does something so ridiculous. Yeah, well, I think South Australia is, is the problem in this, and I think that Mark McGowan, but, but you know, he's serious I've got, I've got about changing GST, but, has to talk... But hang Sorry. on, hang on, hang on, hang on. I don't reckon, maybe I'm wrong, I don't think South Australia would have had a gall to do that bank levy had the federal Liberals not done the same. Do you at least agree with that? Oh, you, 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 you may be right. You may be right. But, um, uh, you know, I mean, obviously, 
the federal uh, tax is one thing. I think the states doing it is extraordinarily problematic. And, and it's a very bad decision for Weatherall because it will discourage business in his state. You know, business can sure. go to other places. So I think it is, it is a, it's quite another thing when it's done at a state oh, level. You're preaching to the converted on that. I think it's a terrible tax. But, Simon, you were shaking your head before. You still think South Australia would have done that if the feds hadn't? No, 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 I don't. I'm, oh, right. I'm agreeing with you. I think that the federal coalition government opened the door to that one uh, very sadly. I don't think they should have done that. I think it was a very bad decision at the federal level and even worse at the state level. But uh, I think it would have been much more politically difficult for the South Australian government to go down that path if the feds hadn't done the same. See, I have to say this while I've got you both on Twitter. Sam Crosby, who this is usually our day, which is a battle of the think tanks. Uh, Simon Brini, you're from the IPA. We often have Sam Crosby on against his regular guest, Nick Cater. Sam Crosby being from the McKell Institute. He's on Twitter bitching and moaning that he's been replaced with someone from the IPA. Well, you know, he's not here, so who's he to complain? But if he were listening, uh, he'd hear you, Simon Brini. Uh, you know, no apologist for the government from the IPA. I mean, you're slamming them on the plebiscite, you're slamming them on the bank tax. This isn't exactly a sort of a free run for Malcolm Turnbull's policy scripts. Oh, look, and if you want to upgrade your, uh, your guests at any time, I think that's all right, Peter. <laughs> Fair enough. All right, um, back to the GST, though, Nick Cater. I mean, at the end of the day, it, it, is, it has got to be the Prime Minister that bites the bullet on this. Mark McGowan, I assume he's talking to Bill Shorten behind closed doors, and I assume he's getting told to get stuffed behind closed doors. But guess what? He'll be able to crack that wide open if Bill Shorten wins the next election and doesn't do anything to help WA, because Mark McGowan will have no other choice. Well, you're right. I think you know, it's a complex issue. Uh, GST, as you know, is, is decided between states. But I think you are right. It is, up, it is up to the Prime Minister to show leadership on this and then to set about persuading his, his state colleagues, you know, that, that it is a, a reform that has to happen. It clearly does. Uh, you know, I mean, it needs to be... Well, we, we don't need to go over the arguments. We know why it's a bad, a, a, a bad system for re redistributing GST. And, and look, South Australia... I'm sorry to pile it on Jay Weatherall, but look, he's asking for it. You know, I mean, they, the whole state is built upon a business model that is about sucking in GST from more prosperous, more hard-working, more diligent states. And, and I think that has to change. Otherwise, South Australia is going to continue to be on this downward spiral. How concerned are you, Simon Brini, about writing standards? It's interesting. I spoke for context earlier on Newsday. I spoke uh, to Dr John Collier, who's the principal of St Andrews Cathedral College uh, in Sydney. But interestingly, he wasn't that concerned about uh, these NAPLAN results because he says they're largely diagnostic and they're not uh, about being interpreted in this sort of polemic way that writing standards writ large are therefore going down. They're about being used as a tool to, to elevate writing standards, if you like, and there's lumpiness in the, in the, in the findings. Maybe true, maybe not. I'm no expert on that. But what my anecdotal evidence is at the university level is that writing standards amongst undergrads isn't as good as they were 10 or 20 years ago, and the writing standard amongst undergrads 10 or 20 years ago isn't as good as it was amongst undergrads 20 years before that. Yeah, look, I, I think, um, you know, it, it's, it's open to interpret... Um, I, the problem with this is the style of writing changes so much over time, the sort of words that people use, you know, uh, how, how are we measuring how good someone's writing is? Um, just because you use more abbreviations or you've got shortened words or there are new words that exist in the English language that didn't 20 years ago, I'm, I'm not too worried about that. What I am a little bit concerned about is that we're not getting real bang for our buck. There's a lot of money going into education, particularly in the primary and secondary school levels at the moment, and um, are we getting an increase in the rate of, uh, you know, maths and science proficiency, for instance, over time? Um, you know, e English is, uh, is another very important part of that, but I'm just not sure that we're getting bang for our buck, and I'd much rather see um, a, a broader debate about uh, curriculum in this country. I think that's, uh, that's the next big battle in education in Australia. All right, we're out of time. I know you'd like to get a word in on that, but we'll have to do it next time. Nick Cater as well as Simon Brini, thanks both of you for your company.